On this Thursday night, a day to honor those lost and reflect on a terrible legacy. Justice for survivors! How the first national day for truth and reconciliation was marked. True reconciliation is about learning, sharing, and growing. Where is the prime minister? The answer igniting anger as he's judged on his actions and not his words. Pressure on the Pope, renewed calls for an apology and for the Catholic Church to release the records on Canada's residential schools. And the story of the first person to wear an orange shirt. By you wearing orange and learning about what happened to us, it's like a little bit of justice. The woman who inspired what's become the day for truth and reconciliation. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us on this first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Ceremonies and events have taken place across this country. This National Day has been years in the making. Until recently, much of the country was unaware of the history of Indian residential schools and their long-lasting legacy. The discovery of unmarked graves of children was a horrifying wake-up call. Today is about honoring them, the survivors, their families and communities. Canada's new Governor General, Mary May Simon, is the first Indigenous person in that role. Her message today is that we all must make reconciliation a way of life, that it requires effort every day. It has no end date or finish line. As we strive to resolve the tensions of the past with the promise of the future, we can stand together and move forward with grace and humility. In Ottawa, hundreds took part in a ceremony on Parliament Hill. Canadians are being called upon to own their own truth when it comes to this country's history and treatment of Indigenous people. Downtown Winnipeg was transformed into a sea of orange as more than a thousand people marched to the Manitoba Legislature, the colour orange symbolizing and honouring thousands of Indigenous children forcibly taken from their homes and sent to residential schools. And in Kamloops, where the unmarked graves of 215 children were discovered this summer, the search continues, as do the calls for action. Nithu Garcha is in Kamloops tonight. Nithu. Donna, a powerful show of support in person behind me here with a drumming circle and around the world. We're hearing international support has crashed the Tecumloops to Shwetmik website where these events behind me are being live streamed. Before they began, Cook P, also known as Chief Roseanne Casimir, provided an update saying that more ground penetrating radar work has been done in recent weeks and artifacts that were recovered are now being analyzed. She believes that more unmarked burial sites will be found as only two of nearly 160 acres so far has been surveyed. We are at the Tecumseh to Shwetmik Pow Wow Arbor, an open air structure which is just steps away from the former Kamloops Indian Residential School, where despite the efforts to eradicate their culture, the focus here today is on reclaiming traditions and sharing them with the world. This includes, as you can hear, singing, traditional honor songs, ceremonial drumming, and with proof of vaccination being checked at the entrance, there are hundreds of people here despite the pandemic, rain and wind. Also in attendance is Assembly of First Nations National Chief Roseanne Archibald who says she won't call them schools anymore, instead referring to them as institutions of assimilation and genocide. Cook P. Roseanne Casimir renewed calls for politicians and the church to release school attendance records so they can work to reunite families with lost loved ones. But Donna, for some of the survivors we spoke to sitting steps away from their former residential school, they say this day is about their grandchildren and a brighter future for them starts with the truths about their trauma being believed with every Canadian embracing our collective history. Here's more from one of the survivors we spoke to. We have to give our children and our grandchildren every opportunity that's available to them. And by being able to showcase our, our songs and our dances here is a door opener for our people in this community because it was uh, lost for a long time. Nithu, we learned today the Prime Minister has flown to British Columbia and is spending some time in Tofino with family. How has that news been received by people there in Kamloops? 
Well, Donna, there is disappointment over Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's absence, and that turned into shock when it was confirmed that the Prime Minister is vacationing with family in Tofino as we speak. To come loose to Schwetmick, Cookie Roseanne Casimir told me she found it upsetting that he would make plans to vacation in the province where he's now received two, quote, heartfelt invitations to come connect with the community here behind me. Here's more of what she had to say. I am truly saddened that he was not able to join us today. I did hold out on hope that maybe that he would be here. We have sent him two invitations. Now, Donna, in a Global News interview during the election campaign, Trudeau did say that he would come to Kamloops when it's, quote, right and appropriate to do so. He has yet to visit this community since that announcement of the unmarked burial sites in late May. And the chief here says she's holding on to hope that he will come sooner rather than later. Back to you. All right, Neethu Garsha in Kamloops, BC tonight, thanks. Canada's Conference of Catholic Bishops has apologized, but the chief of the Kamloops de Sequequot First Nation says it rings hollow as long as the church continues to withhold records of the children who died. If this apology is truly a commitment, then Tecumos de Shwetmik insists on the complete and full production of all relevant documents and records in a manner and form that is useful and accessible to Indian residential school survivors to help identify those missing and those unmarked graves and repatriating those lost. Catholic bishops have promised millions of dollars to support Indigenous reconciliation. Robin Gill talks to people living with the terrible legacy of residential schools about what that and an apology means to them. Seashelt Indian Residential School operated until 1975 on what is considered British Columbia's Sunshine Coast. Gertie Pierre has nothing but dark memories from the time she walked through those doors at the age of five. She suffered years of abuse at the hands of the nuns and priests. When, you know, I got out of that school, I, I was such an angry, angry young girl. Now, 75 years old, she's had time to heal. I forgive, you know, the brothers, sisters, the nuns and the priests. But she doesn't accept the recent apology from Canada's bishops. She wants to hear from the top of the Catholic Church. It should come from the higher up. Over the next five years, Canada's Catholic churches will fundraise $30 million. The money will be put toward Indigenous reconciliation projects, including counselling. Cindy Blackstock has long been an advocate for children who were lost in the residential school system. She believes these gestures are hollow. It's good that they put out the words, but as the elder said, integrity is when words have meaning. And the TRC call to action is for the Pope to come to Canada and to accept responsibility for the church's role in residential schools. The, commission has the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, also known as the TRC, spent years collecting stories from survivors sent to boarding schools, which were primarily institutions, to break their link to their language, to their culture, to their families. This is well over 100 years of, of genocidal policies of, that were imposed. Literally generations of, of Indigenous um, children uh, were brought into to residential schools. Gertie Pierre considers herself Catholic, but her Indigenous spirituality plays just as big a role. Now she waits to see what the church does next. I'm not their judge. You know, the, the, the great spirit is the judge. The anger of her youth may be gone, but she can never forget the terrible lessons she and so many other children learned at residential schools. Robin Gill, Global News, Vancouver. In 2015, the TRC clearly outlined 94 calls to action, what the federal and provincial governments need to do to continue to uncover the truth and work towards reconciliation. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau accepted that report and pledged to implement all the calls to action. As David Aiken reports, he is being judged on his actions, not his words. First came the harm. For most of Canada's history, the official policy of the federal government towards Indigenous people forced assimilation. Residential schools, a key tool for that job. Canada's assimilation policies that have attempted to extinguish us as a people. Again, make no mistake, this is genocide. Then a change and an apology. The government of Canada now recognizes that it was wrong to forcibly remove children from their homes 
and we apologize for having done this. That was followed by a commission to find the truth and propose ways to reconcile Canada and the land's Indigenous peoples. And in 2015, a new Prime Minister and new promises to fulfill all 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It sets us squarely on the path to true reconciliation. But ambition has often exceeded action. Too many priorities remain unfulfilled. We're no longer accepting hollow apologies. Concrete actions and change behaviors are essential. On this first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, for example, 32 First Nations communities are still without clean water. And just a handful of First Nations have the authority or the resources to run their own education and child welfare systems. In the just-concluded federal election, more promises to do better. This election mattered and the choice Canadians made to go even further and even faster on the fight against climate change, to go even stronger on reconciliation, including on economic reconciliation and creating uh, opportunities for Indigenous peoples across this country. The Prime Minister participated in a reconciliation ceremony Wednesday night here on Parliament Hill. His posted public itinerary for today said he was to be in Ottawa for private meetings, but in fact, Global News discovered he was not in Ottawa, but he and his family were on a plane by 7 a.m. Eastern to travel to Tofino, B.C. on Vancouver Island's west coast. So in that sense, on this National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, the PMO's posted itinerary was not that truthful. Now, the PMO confirmed that Trudeau and his family will have a few days of downtime in Tofino, but that today the Prime Minister spent time on the plane talking by phone to residential school survivors. Donna? Okay, David Aiken in Ottawa, thank you. We understand these stories and marking this day may be difficult for many people. If you or someone you know needs support, you can call 1-866-925-4419. The Indian Residential Schools Crisis Line operates 24 hours a day. The struggle for young Indigenous Canadians to find jobs coming up, how they're critical to rebuilding the economy. Plus, how should reconciliation be defined and measured? In an exclusive interview with Global News, the president of Moderna says delaying a second dose of its COVID-19 vaccine up to four months has likely extended protection. So will Canadians need a booster? Carolyn Jarvis is looking into that tonight. When some Canadian provinces decided to delay second doses of the COVID-19 vaccine, it caused a stir. Would going off-label change the effectiveness of the vaccine? Now, as the Delta variant rages around the world, the president of Moderna, Stephen Hoag, says Canadians who waited longer for a second dose of its vaccine could be seeing longer protection as a result. I think in retrospect, we will probably say that time between the doses extended the durability of the vaccine. Moderna's clinical trial data, where people received two doses 28 days apart, indicates antibodies start to decrease after six months. At around the one-year mark, they started to see breakthrough infections. And that really is the intersection of this declining immunity and an increasing force of infection from Delta at about one year in the United States that causes us to say, we think a booster dose of the vaccine will we'll get that neutralizing immunity back up where it was and nice and strong and stop those breakthrough cases. Moderna is now advocating for a booster of half the original dose six months after your second shot. So is it plausible because Canadians took longer to get the second dose, they won't need a booster as quickly as others. I think it's not only plausible, I think it's likely. Because the more recently you were boosted with your second dose, the less likely you're going to need a third dose booster. Dr. Danuta Skoronsky at the BC Centre for Disease Control is monitoring vaccine effectiveness in real time and says the protection from two doses of an mRNA vaccine remains terrific. When you have a longer interval between the first and the second dose, you generally get higher vaccine immune responses. While Skoronsky says there's no evidence supporting the need for a booster for everyone at this point, Hogue counters, things could look very different in a few months. If you received your second dose in the summer, um, six months from now, it could become a very bad moment because you'll see high forces of infection and breakthroughs. Come Christmas time in Canada, things could look very different. 
I think that's the concern, that in Christmas things could look very different. Carolyn Jarvis, Global News, Boston. Ahead, why Canada's Indigenous workforce is key to pandemic recovery. The pandemic has been especially difficult for young Indigenous people looking for work. They're Canada's fastest growing demographic and as Anne Gaviola explains, ensuring their employment is key to economic recovery. The first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation really hits home for Carissa Menz. My grandma is a residential school survivor from Saskatchewan and she's still struggling with it. And there's generations of trauma and it's real. The pandemic has turned her life upside down. After a decade working her way up in the restaurant industry, she lost her livelihood for months. Slide it through here. Okay. With the help of Access, an Aboriginal community career service based in Vancouver, she's reskilled and has just been hired at an electrical contracting company, paving the way for a brighter future. I can save money and the goal eventually, maybe not in Vancouver right now, but uh, is to buy a house. COVID took a big toll on Indigenous employment. In the summer of 2020, the jobless rate among Aboriginal workers soared to nearly 17%, hitting Indigenous youth. In particular, more than one in four were out of work. And according to analysis by RBC, the unemployment rate for Indigenous people was 5% higher than the national average in the five years leading up to COVID. Experts say there's an opportunity to do better. The fastest growing part of the population is Indigenous youth. Roughly, we estimate 750,000 Indigenous youth who are coming into the labour force, into their prime. The pandemic has been a roller coaster for Carvel Electric, a Métis-owned business in Alberta. The family-run company laid off half its staff in the summer of 2020, only to rebound and hire each one of them back a few months later. Now they're hiring and expanding. The core value of our company is create opportunities for Indigenous people. And uh, that's been a core value of our family uh, for years. But for every story of triumph, there's a story of struggle. The Indigenous business community is asking the federal government to meet targets for procurement from Indigenous companies and prioritize access to fast, reliable internet from coast to coast to coast. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Next, the journey to reconciliation. For most Canadians, the term reconciliation is familiar yet difficult to define. Tonight, Ross Lord looks at how some are walking the path towards it. To skate. Tell them come in. It's sliding away. They are terms most of us have never heard, words used by Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq long before hockey became Canada's most popular sport. Discoveries, even to the women who created this hockey documentary, Cheryl Maloney and her sister April. And I think the game of hockey is is such an amazing integral part of Canada and Canadians and that if our children grow up knowing the Mi'kmaq had this amazing role in, in sharing this, can you imagine what that does for reconciliation? History that was unknown or forgotten, like Mi'kmaq craftsmen making hockey sticks in the 1800s, sticks that were widely used in the early days of the National Hockey League. We had no clue when we started this that it would become such an amazing um, story. And to today reflect on that, how that story was lost to not just my family, but to Canadians. Reclaiming pride through history. One way, perhaps, to accelerate reconciliation. These researchers from the University of Manitoba's Social Justice Laboratory are working to develop a reconciliation barometer that considers a wide range of indicators. Understanding what's happened, the connection between the past and the present, current uh, you know, inequalities um, and uh, strengths within you know, communities. We can get a better sense of you know, where are we doing well, uh, where are we not doing well, and where do we then need to focus our efforts. They plan to complete their reconciliation barometer later this year after six years of planning. Back in Nova Scotia, Cheryl Maloney found another point of pride. Her son, Chase, posing with this 1917 stick after they discovered it was handmade by his great-great-grandfather, Alexander Cope. We're just trying to acknowledge, you know, the roots of this game and the role of the Mi'kmaq people. And, and I think that's something great for Canadians that we can celebrate. Different methods for reconciling the past and creating a future of equality and fairness. 
Ross Lohr, Global News, Shubenacadie, Nova Scotia. That's Global National. I'm Donna Friesen. Thanks for watching. September 30th, Truth and Reconciliation Day has long been known as Orange Shirt Day, and it's worth remembering who wore the first orange shirt. Her name is Phyllis Webstad. She's 54 now. It's what happened to her when she was six, living on a reserve that's never left her. Lived with my grandmother. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have running water. It was 1973, the year she was sent to St. Joseph's Mission Residential School, just outside Williams Lake, B.C. That day, she wore a bright orange shirt. I remember it was an uh, orange, shiny color. But when I got to the, the mission, it was taken, and I, I never wore it again. And I didn't understand why, and nothing was ever explained why things were happening. She talked about that orange shirt when she testified before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2013. But friendly and strange. And she's kept telling her story, writing books, teaching a new generation the truth about residential schools, and inspiring the orange shirt movement. The color orange has always reminded me of that and how my feelings didn't matter, how no one cared and how I felt like I was worth nothing, she writes. All of us little children were crying, and no one cared. That sense of worthlessness, of insignificance, is a legacy that spans generations. My grandmother attended for 10 years, all of her 10 children, including my mother for 10 years, and myself for one. She says since then she's been on a healing journey and is helping lead the country on that journey. Her story is only one among many, and telling it has helped others open up and tell theirs. Webstad says she didn't set out to do this, but that from the very beginning, the whole orange shirt movement has been divinely guided. The ancestors are behind this whole movement. And that is what gives her the strength to continue.